Good afternoon, y'all. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt O'Neill. I'm a visiting professor of history and Southern studies at the University of Mississippi. Uh, and it is my honor to introduce our South Talks speaker today, uh, Nima Avashia. Uh, Nima Avashia is the daughter of Indian immigrants and was born and raised in Southern West Virginia. Uh, she's been an educator and activist in the Boston Public Schools since 2003 and was named a City of Boston Educator of the Year in 2013. Uh, her first book, uh, which she's going to be talking to us a little bit about today, uh, is Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place. Uh, so her South Talk today um, is going to explore what happens when we challenge dominant narratives about the South, about Appalachia, uh, what happens when we write and we publish and amplify narratives that complicate our understandings of places and people. Uh, so with that, uh, let me say welcome uh, to Nima and looking forward to the talk. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Afton and the Center for inviting me to be with you today. I was telling Afton uh, before, I really wish I could be in Oxford. Um, I'm a big foodie and I've wanted to go to the snack bar forever. So I am sad that I'm not there, but I have a 16 month old and she makes it a little bit harder to travel nowadays. So one of these days I'll get down there to the snack bar. It's on my on my bucket list to do. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit and give you some framing um, for the book. And then I'll read a couple essays and I'd love to sort of just engage in a conversation with people. Um, so um, this title is very fancy, but it's not really that that complicated of an idea, which is that um, I'm from a part of the country, much like Mississippi, West Virginia is a place that is very misrepresented and very misunderstood by most of America. Um, and when I left West Virginia, the question I always got from people was, where are you from? And I would say West Virginia and people's response would be like, well, no, that's not possible. There are no Indian people in West Virginia. Um, and it made me think a lot about why that is the narrative. Like, why is that how people understand the place that I'm from? And I think there are a lot of roots, but certainly one has to do with uh, the war on poverty um, and the images of Appalachia that came out of the war on poverty, which rendered sort of an, an image of place that was very homogenous. Um, I think that mainstream media also plays a role. We had, um, I don't know, let's see if anybody anybody recognizes this, this particular show. You can yell it out, put it in the chat if you recognize it. Um, this is going back a ways, but the Beverly Hillbillies, which is a show that people would sort of like use to make associations about the place that I was from. We had Deliverance, which I can't tell you the number of people, times people asked me if where I was from was like Deliverance. More recently, we have hillbillyology, right? And all of these sort of mainstream media representations render Appalachia as a place that is homogenous. It is white, it is straight, it is Christian, it is working class, and it is not a place of diversity. And for a lot of my life, what that meant was I just felt like I was going to have to always explain this anomaly about myself. People weren't going to understand it, and it would just be this thing I explained. Um and it wasn't until much later that I started to think about the question of like, what would happen if instead of just explaining it away again and again, I actually asserted the existence of my family and my community? What would happen if instead of saying, yes, we were this anomaly, I said, but there's something to learn from the anomaly. It really wasn't until around the time of the 2016 election um, when West Virginia and a lot of parts of Appalachia um, did vote overwhelmingly for Trump. And this book came out, um, Hillbillyology by J.D. Vance, which sat on the New York Times bestseller list for 54 weeks, um, but that if you talk to most of the people who I know from growing up, most of us couldn't get through the book. Uh, most of us read about 30 pages and we're like, this isn't it. This doesn't describe the place that we're from. It doesn't, we don't recognize the narrative here. And most importantly, we don't agree with the political argument that's being made about why things are the way they are in Appalachia. The existence of this dominant narrative started to make me think about the harm that such a, such a dominant and prevalent narrative can do. And like what happens when you erase an entire groups of people? Matt and I were talking before we started, and he's done a lot of research on, on the Great Migration in Appalachia. There, Harlan, Kentucky, McDowell County, West Virginia, Black families have lived in those places for generations. 
There have been Indian and Filipino immigrants to Appalachia since the passage of the Heart Cellar Act in 1965. There have been Chinese people in the Mississippi Delta for probably going on 150 years now, right? What happens when we erase all of those people from the narrative? What's the harm that that does? Is a question I started to think about more and more. And I did not think that I was going to write a New York Times bestseller that would sit on that list for 54 weeks in any way, shape, or form. But I did start to wonder what would happen if I put my family on the cover of a book? What would happen if I took a place like West Virginia, and this is a very iconic um, West Virginia photograph. Pretty much every family in West Virginia has this picture. This is a, a grist mill called Babcock Mill. And it's like a annual migration for people to go down to Babcock Mill and take a picture there in the fall foliage. But 99% of the time, the picture that you're seeing is of white West Virginians. And yet I have that picture, but I have it with my Desi family and our friends and our community, right? Like what would happen to the mainstream narrative if we interrupt it just a little bit and say, well, I'm not gonna pretend like I have the narrative about Appalachia, but I have another Appalachian story. And if I tell you there's another one, does that maybe make you consider that there could also be more another's? that for my another, there's also another story that's about growing up black in Southern West Virginia. There's another story about growing up Jewish in West Virginia. There's another story about growing up Filipino in that place that all of these communities existed. Be they small, they existed and they complicate the understanding of the place. Um, this became, I think, particularly something that, that solidified for me in the context of the floods that happened in Eastern Kentucky in 2022. Um, because what I watched happen in Boston, where I live, um, is I watched a lot of people say, well, they deserve those floods. That's what you get when you vote for Mitch McConnell. Um, and on a cellular level, I really struggle with that idea. First of all, I don't think anybody deserves to be flooded out of their home or killed because of who they vote for. But secondly, how could even someone come to a place where they could say that? Like, how is that a thing that we could say about other human beings? And I think it has a lot to do with the dominant narrative. I think when we have these monolithic narratives, it allows us to reduce people and to make them less human. And I think that is a real issue with the way that Appalachia and the South are rendered um, in mainstream conversations. People are not afforded the same level of humanity in those spaces. And so in large part, what I think about with writing a book like Another Appalachia is like, how does doing that challenge that dehumanization? How does making the perception of a place more complicated make it harder to reduce people to being less human? Um, it's something I'm trying to think about both on sort of a societal level, but also on an individual level, a really powerful thing that's happened to me because of this book is the way I've been able to connect with readers in Appalachia who haven't necessarily seen themselves reflected in the mainstream narratives either. Right. So there's a political argument for um, for complicating the dominant narrative, but there's also a personal one, which is until I wrote this book, I had never read a book that represented what it meant to be queer, Desi and Appalachian. For me to have a mirror in my literature, like I had to write it. It didn't exist. Right. And for a lot of people growing up in Appalachia right now, those mirrors are not there. They don't exist for kids like being rural and being queer and being able to read a book that has your questions that shares your identity um, is not an experience enough young people are having. And so I, 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 I kind of kept, uh, I keep like the messages I get from, um, from people when they read the book. Right. And I, I get messages like this one at least once a week. Right. I love seeing myself on the pages of this book. I love that I'm not the only one. This for me is like the other really important element of amplifying anotherness is that there are so many anothers in Appalachia and the South. There are so, they may be, again, small groups of people, but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to see themselves mirrored. And that doesn't mean that they don't deserve to sort of like feel held by literature and by the stories that we tell about a place. And so on both levels, on the sort of like political level of challenging the dehumanization of an entire region, but also on the personal level of, of reaching readers who often in the places where they live feel alone and feel disconnected and can feel like they don't know how they fit. Um, those two pieces to me uh, make a really compelling argument for continuing to amplify these narratives of anotherness and continuing to think about how do we keep lifting up stories that complicate. That it's, if you're the only one, that's fine. Tell that story. If you're one of 10, tell that story that those stories are, are profoundly powerful and important in challenging the dominant narrative. 
It's also why I feel like a big piece of what I've tried to do in my work since publishing the book is um, kind of like connect myself to the folks in communities who are doing that work every day, right? Um, and my, I, I'm a central Appalachia person. I spend most of my time in West Virginia and Kentucky. So the organizations I think about are in that space. But um, an organization like Apple Shop has been thinking about anotherness in Appalachia for 50 years at this point and trying to think about how do we represent that complexity in film and an image. Um, tiny bookstores in tiny towns, the Reed Spotted Newt, which is in Hazard, Kentucky, it's the size of the room that I'm in right now. And yet, if you looked at their shelves, they represent this diversity of books about Appalachia and from Appalachian people that is really incredible. And I've gone to that bookstore and every time I go there, there are young queer people there who are looking to find themselves on the shelves of that bookstore. The anotherness exists. And so what is our role in lifting it up? Like, how do we sort of think about every time someone says a thing like, oh, well, people deserve this because of who they vote for. How is my response? But what about all these people? Like, what about all these people who are doing incredible work, who are staying and fighting for the places that they love and care about, who are like refuse to be forced to choose between being queer and being Appalachian or being black and being Appalachian? Like, how do we make those stories the center of the narrative instead of living at the margins? For me, like that's the work that's really, I think, gone on since my book has been published. It took publishing it, I think, to kind of like solidify it and and kind of as like proof of theory that that if you tell one, it sort of helps you to see where it fits on a shelf or where it fits in the world with other people who are doing similar work, with other people who are thinking about these questions. Um, but living in Boston, I feel like it's been particularly important in in challenging the ideas of people around me. Um, who don't understand the place that I'm from and who, in a lot of ways, I think this book has made them stop and think just a little bit harder about the thing they're about to say about West Virginia or about Appalachia and to maybe pause before they kind of like reinforce these stereotypes and these sort of negative narratives that continue to be ascribed to the place that I'm from. Um, I always say like when I read in in Appalachia, it's so different than reading outside. Like when I read outside Appalachia, I often feel like I'm in a museum and like people are looking at me and are like, what, what are you? Like, how did you come to be? And when I read in Appalachia, it's not like that at all. It almost feels like we're in a group and we're all talking about the questions that, that, that we're all grappling with and struggling with, right? And I think that there's need for both of those things. Um, there's need for, for narratives that resonate and reflect the people who live in Appalachia in the South and who can see themselves in those stories and those questions. And there's also need for those narratives to cha challenge the way that people outside of Appalachia in the South um, think about the place that we're from. Uh, I think we all deserve a lot more humanity and a lot more grace than is being extended, uh, particularly to West Virginia and Mississippi, pretty much every minute of every day. And I, I'm hopeful that this idea of of anotherness and of just like lifting that up again and again, maybe is an opportunity to create some more of that grace. Um, so I'm just going to read you two pieces um, from my book, and then I'm happy to take questions from y'all or just for it to, again, I feel like this is... Appalachia is kind of this South adjacent region. Um, I think there are going to be some shared questions. And so we can kind of treat it that way of like, how are we all thinking about these questions and the work that we do? Um, but I'm going to read you two pieces. Um, they're both fairly short. Um, this first one is called, I'm going to actually stop sharing. Um, it's called Be Like Wilt. And Wilt is Wilt Chamberlain. I stand on the foul line at the Cross Lanes Methodist Church gym. I'm nine, the only girl playing on an all boys basketball team, the only brown kid on a team of white boys. My puny arms, thick glasses, and long oiled braids set me even further apart from their wiry muscular bodies and crop blonde haircuts. Why has Carl Bradford chosen me for his team? I wonder about this. His sons are two of the quickest, highest scoring players in our local league. In 1988, in Cross Lanes, West Virginia, there is no designated league for girls. And when I try out one Saturday in October, there are only two other girls in the gym with close to 80 boys. Tryouts in this pre-hyper-competitive era involve dribbling up and down the court and shooting two layups and a couple of foul shots. Every kid is guaranteed a space on a team. The question is simply which coach will choose to take them on. Each girl is selected for a different team. Some teams have no girls. Mr. Bradford doesn't have to pick me, but he does anyway. 
In doing so, he also takes on the responsibility of chauffeuring me to and from practices and games. Basketball is not a spot, sport my immigrant parents understand, and the parental time commitment it requires is not something their lives leave space for. By opting to play, I take a step further away from my nuclear family and closer to my West Virginia community. Still, my Indian genetics make me short, weak, and terribly uncoordinated. When I shoot the ball overhand, it falls short of the basket by several feet. When I play defense, my teammates say I look like a praying mantis, my hands weaving in front of me instead of out to the sides. I love the game, but I'm about as far from a natural talent as my parents' hometown in India is from this gym at the end of Frontier Drive. One evening, Mr. Bradford proposes that I shoot the ball a different way. Not overhand, as I've been trying to, but underhand. Granny style, my teammates disparagingly call it. Some of the greatest basketball players of all time shot underhand, Nima, Mr. Bradford says. Wilt Chamberlain shot underhand. His blue eyes, magnified by round wire rim glasses, probe mine. In my adult life, I have listened to entire podcasts about the accuracy of the granny shot about how Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points in the one game where he shot free throws underhand, and Rick Barry's career free throw percentage was a chart-topping 89.3 because he opted to do the same. But at age nine, I feel like this is yet another way in which I'm being set apart from my peers. Raised by fathers who were players of the game, taught to play at driveway hoops as soon as they could walk, they can shoot overhand. I cannot. How do you assimilate into the dominant culture when your own culture is so invisible to the majority? My small group of Indian peers and I answer this question in different ways. The only Indian boy at my elementary school, who all the white kids either think is my brother or insist I should date, speaks with an exaggerated twang, drinks heavily through high school, and loudly votes Republican later on. Some of the Indian kids who live in the city of Charleston emulate their wealthy white classmates, picking up tennis or golf as entry points into American culture. As for me, I choose basketball. I play the sport constantly, watch it obsessively on the TV in our basement, and rock my satin, turquoise, and purple Charlotte Hornets jacket daily, and not simply because I love the game. I do, but basketball is more than just a sport for me. It's my way into a world where I otherwise don't seem to belong. I blush hard at the suggestion to shoot underhand, dribble a basketball against the white linoleum flooring of the gym, and stare at the black curve of the key instead of making eye contact with Mr. Bradford. I know he's right. But I'm not sure I can find the courage to shoot granny style in a game where all my teammates and classmates from school will be watching. Much later in his career, Chamberlain explained why he only shot underhand for one season and reverted to the less accurate overhand free throw afterwards. I felt silly, like a sissy shooting underhanded, he said. I know I was wrong. I know some of the best foul shooters in history shot that way. I just couldn't do it. Even though I haven't heard this explanation in 1988, I struggle with the same sentiment. Eventually, however, my fear, my desire to make a basket overwhelms my fear of judgment. Game day comes, the point guard gets the ball into my hands, and I position the ball between my legs before hurling it upwards. Swish. It isn't a buzzer beater. It's not the game-winning shot. It is just two points scored midway through the third quarter in a regular season game. But the entire gym erupts in cheers, the crowd chanting my name. Someone even calls my mom from the payphone in the corner. I grow so dizzy with this temporary but overwhelming sense of belonging that I fail to register the final score. After the game, Mr. Bradford gives me his slow, sweet smile. See, Nima, it doesn't matter how you shoot the ball. It just matters that the ball goes in. Mr. Bradford drafts me for his team each of the next three years. At the end of my last season, he persuades all the coaches to jointly award me the league's heart and hustle trophy, given not to the most talented player, but to the most dedicated team member. It remains, to this day, the award I cherish most. When I age out of his league, he recruits me as an assistant coach for his younger son's team. His red Jeep Cherokee is a fixture outside our house at least three days a week as he continues to drive me to and from practices and games. Each evening after practice, we drive over Goff Mountain. The headlights of the Jeep cast the only light on the dark and winding road that takes us past a pungent chemical landfill and through a dense stand of trees. Close your eyes now, he commands as we approach the summit of the mountain. In the back seat, the boys and I giggle and grin, close our eyes, take a deep breath. Mr. Bradford hits the gas and we soar over the first hill, our stomachs dropping roller coaster style. The Jeep bounces hard on the concrete, then takes flight again as we hit the second decline. For this brief moment, we are Bo, Luke, and Daisy in the General Lee. 
Our screams of delight replace the sounds of Dixie and this reimagined Dukes of Hazard, and I am wildly, freely American in a way I can never recapture outside of Mr. Bradford's presence. Thanks. And I've got one more for you. Uh, it's in three parts. It's a little heavier than the first one. Uh, it's called Our Armor. One, my mother's morning preparations always took the same form. She emerged from the bathroom after her shower, the air around her perfumed by a heady mix of talcum powder and baby oil. Dressed in a blouse and petticoat, the softness of her belly just filled over the tightness of the drawstring waist. From my perch on her bed, I watched her get ready for the day ahead, following her movements through her reflection in the mirror. First, she mercilessly attacked the knots in her waist-length hair with a plastic comb, then used her slender fingers to divide the hair into three equal sections, which she braided without looking, only pulling the braid over her shoulder when her arms could no longer reach far enough down her back. Next, she wrapped a sari around her body, pleating and draping six yards of silk with a tailor's precision. Last, she put on her ornaments, thin gold bangles that jangled solidly on her wrists, small gold hoop earrings, a black and gold pearl mongol sutra around her neck, a black mascara chanlo on her forehead. Ensemble complete, she stepped out of our home and into the wilds of small town West Virginia. In such a foreign context, she opted to own her foreignness rather than hide it on her walks to school, at her job as an accountant, during her service on the board of the local library as a troop leader for the Girl Scouts. The Chanlo was a marker of marriage for Indian women of my mom's generation. It has many names. They look in Bindi are two of the most common, but in Gujarati, Chanlo is a preferred one. Placed between the eyebrows at the side of the sixth chakra, it's said to represent the third eye and the notion of hidden wisdom. Indian women in India mark their heads with vermilion powder or with tiny stickers in a multitude of shapes, colors, and designs to match each of their saris. For my mother, none of these options were available. There was no Indian grocery store where she could purchase vermilion or sheets of chanlo stickers. So she did what immigrants in America always do to survive. She modified, bought mascara from Rite Aid, perfected the art of drawing a tiny black circle on her forehead with a fuzzy curvy brush, never left the house unmarked. By midday, the chanlo would begin to crust, crumbled bits of mascara landing on her cheeks or chin. My mother carried her mascara in her purse. Even at the height of tax season with its 16 hour work days, at the first sign of crumble, she would take a moment to go to the bathroom, wash off the remains of the mascara and reapply, determined to keep her third eye intact. I used to think my mother was an embarrassment. Her silky clothes and glittering jewelry contrasted so sharply with the hairspray stiffened perms and acid washed mom jeans of my classmates' mothers. Our brownness in a white world already marked us as other. Why did she need to heighten the distinction? In Jersey City around this time, white supremacists, self-proclaimed dot busters, chased Indian women down the street, beat them when they caught them. The way to stay safe, I thought, was to blend in. And my dazzling mother, dazzling in both her style and her personality, never blended into the bland linoleum and polyester environs of 1980s West Virginia. I shushed my mother when she spoke to me in Gujarati in public, its pitch and tone so different than that of English. Speak English, I'd demand, refusing to acknowledge her if she wouldn't. Children can be so cruel, the saying goes, and I was living proof. I curse my cruelty now when I can't find the vocabulary in Gujarati to communicate complex ideas, or when I wear a sari and my mother's stinging response is that I look weird because she can't reconcile my short hair with traditional clothing. I want to believe that my message of assimilation pushed so strongly on my mother was born of my need for safety, both my own and my mother's. But this safety came at tremendous cost. My mother's saris now gather dust in her closet, only worn on the most special of occasions. Two, Pamela Circle was never a flag-waving neighborhood in the 80s and 90s. My neighbor's yards did not boast flagpoles. Their porches lacked flag holders. Flapping American flags were flown in schoolyards, not front yards. Flapping Confederate flags were flown in yards in other neighborhoods. I learned very early not to trespass through. But on my street, the main morning sounds were those of birds chirping and basketballs pounding on pavement, not red, white, and blue bunting flapping in the breeze. Until late September in 2001, that is, when my parents took a trip to Portland, Oregon. They sat in their rental car at a stoplight downtown when a group of white men approached, banged on their hood, and rocked the car. The men screamed epithets and curses and the favorite phrase of white supremacists everywhere hurled at those of us who are not white. Go back to where you came from. 
The light changed. My father slammed on the gas pedal, charging forward, unconcerned about whether he ran over anyone's feet in the process. Later that same fall, on a Greyhound bus in Logan, West Virginia, less than an hour from our home, white passengers tackled an older Indian man and pinned him to the floor. They viewed his frequent trips to the bathroom as suspicious instead of being the result of a failing prostate. They only removed their knees from his back when police arrived to take him off the bus. For 25 years, precisely the same amount of time he had spent living in India, my father had worked to make West Virginia feel like home. And then, any glimmer of insider status he'd gained in two and a half decades evaporated between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. on September 11th of 2001. After their trip, my father promptly went to Castro Hardware and purchased a massive American flag decal emblazoned with a saying, proud to be an American. He taped it to our glass front door, leaving sticky residue marks of many crooked attempts before he felt satisfied that it was straight. Another flag got taped into the back windshield of his blue Toyota van. A third got placed in a holder on the porch. 640 miles away in Madison, Wisconsin, I compulsively went across the street every afternoon to check on the Punjabi Sikhs who ran the gas station, using them as a proxy for my parents. Four days after 9-11, Balbir Singh Sodhi, a Punjabi man my father's age, was murdered at his gas station in Arizona by Frank Silveroque, a white supremacist who shouted, I'm a patriot and I stand for America all the way when arrested. So these brown skin and turban were all it took for him to be interpreted as a threat, as a terrorist, as someone whose murder was justified. I did not believe my father's flags would keep him safe, but I could not ask him to take them down. I struggled with his assertion of patriotism towards a country that had only shown me ambivalence regarding my existence and simultaneously lived in fear of what might happen to my parents if the Confederate flag waivers of other neighborhoods found their way to our street, so profoundly apolitical and welcoming up to this point. My parents' professional lives as doctors and accountants may have buffered them from the worst of West Virginia's racism before 9-11. I, on the other hand, felt its effects from the age of six, when a chubby, rat tail kindergartner approached me in the schoolyard, slapped me across the face, and hit me with the ugliest of racial slurs, illustrating that in West Virginia, there were only two categories that seemed to matter when it came to race, white and not white. And again, when fans of the opposing middle school basketball team screamed Mr. Miyagi and Speedy Gonzalez and Where's Your Papoose each time I walked onto the court, showering me with trash and epithets, then pissed on our school bus at the end of the game. And again, when a high school classmate with his heavily jawed mullet and black Metallica t-shirt pulled over his enormous belly, called me camel jockey every day during shop class, and our teacher pretended not to hear him. Until 9-11, my parents did not question their belonging in America. America provided them work wealth, the opportunity to live a kind of life impossible to imagine in India, and to bring family members in India into its slow-growing middle class. Meanwhile, I, exposed daily to the ugliest manifestations of American ignorance, received continual reminders that I did not belong. If the flag could protect my parents from this venom and from the thick, incapacitating doubt that such venom shuttles to the brain, I would not ask them to take it down. Three. I can't remember when I began to openly flaunt my West Virginia roots, to wear t-shirts emblazoned with images of West Virginia and the lyrics to Country Roads, to proudly share every historical and cultural factoid I'd collected during my time living in the state and have continued to collect after leaving. I can, however, remember the first time a white man in West Virginia told me, go back to where you came from. At a gas station in Sissonville in the fall of 1995, in between chugs from his 40 ounce beer bottle. And the second time, on the side of the road in Nashville, Tennessee, in the summer of 96, screamed out a car window. And the third time, at Ogle Bay Park in Wheeling, in the fall of 1998, when a leering cowboy held up his hand and said, how? Mocking a Lakota greeting. He asked me what tribe I was from, and when I responded that I was not that kind of Indian, proceeded to spit hate in my face. And again, in the summer of 2019, when the newspaper headlines announced that our white male president scolded a group of black and brown congresswomen using that very same phrase. I hate the way my body responds to acts of racism. Where others are simply are able to stay calm and unaffected or angrily fight back, I simply disintegrate. My eyes blur, my temples pound, and I catalog counter arguments in my mind, but my dry mouth, the fear squeezing my chest cavity, prevents me from saying a word. I want in those moments to assert my Americanness, my West Virginianness, to pull out the birth certificate detailing my birth at Thomas Hospital in Charleston, West Virginia, in the heart of the Kanawha Valley. That muddy river valley, those green mountains, those smoking chemical stacks, they are where I come from. So much so that I'm writing this essay in a room in my house entirely de 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 dedicated to the state of West Virginia. 
The walls are decorated with a wedding ring quilt, a painting of the New River Gorge, and a map of West Virginia that dates back to the late 1800s. My light source is a lamp from the Blanco Blasco factory in Milton, 20 minutes from where I grew up. I want to show my doubters that I'm an expansive encyclopedia of knowledge about West Virginia, most of which I learned in my eighth grade West Virginia studies course, or have memorized from the actual West Virginia encyclopedia, my favorite coffee table book. Do you know your state bird and state animal? Mine are the cardinal and the black bear. Can you name every celebrity to come out of your home state? I can, y'all. Chuck Yeager was born in Myra long before he flew his plane so fast that he broke the sound barrier. Jerry West was from Shell Yen, or Zeke from Cabin Creek, years before he made the NBA All-Star team 14 times. Walter Dean Myers was born in Martinsburg before he became a phenomenal writer for young adults. Henry Louis Gates and his brilliant brain spent their formative years in Kaiser. Randy Moss first played football in the backyards of Rand, and Lou Holtz did the same in Fallensby. And Jennifer Garner wasn't born in West Virginia, but she lived there for most of her childhood before kicking ass on ABC's Alias, where her code name on missions was often Mountaineer. There are Americans whose ancestors have lived in the same state for centuries who don't always know as much about their states as I do. This is a fact. And it is also a fact that knowledge is not the marker of belonging in America that I want it to be. When Congresswomen born and raised in the United States are being told to return to the places they came from on the basis of their skin color and their last names, I find myself questioning when or whether our country will ever see people who look like me, my parents, or my child as American. In the absence of a body that knows how to effectively respond to racism, I wrap myself in my home shirt with the state of West Virginia replacing the O in much the same way that my mother wrapped herself in six yards of silken sari, or my father wrapped himself in the American flag, as though fabric can protect us, as though fabric will make it impossible for angry men to see through the cloth to the skin below. Thank you. So those are just like a couple examples of essays in the book that, again, are trying to assert existence, right? Trying to show what it was like to grow up in this place. And they don't speak to, I think, anything larger than that experience. I'm not trying to say that I know what it's like to be every Appalachian person or to live every Appalachian life. I'm not trying to write another hillbillyology. I think that's what that book does is assert that there's a, there is one way that everyone is. Um, but but I think that the question of like if 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 we ask particularly young people to to tell their story of what it means to grow up in a place, whatever that means, like how do we create a shelf that is more complicated than a single narrative? And how then does that shelf do so much work in terms of helping people to see um, the regions of the country that we're from as more complicated and nuanced places, as deserving of grace and humanity? And, and how does that push back against, I think, the, pol the polarization that we're experiencing in this moment, which is so profound um, and is so not reflective of actual lived experiences in those places. I often tell people the most radical people I know live in Appalachia, um, way more radical than anybody up here in Boston, because issues are not theoretical for them. The same thing is true in Mississippi. It's not theoretical. If you're fighting climate change in Appalachia, it's because you're being flooded out of your house and if you're fighting against um, mass incarceration. It's because people are building prisons where there used to be coal mines. It's it's in your face all the time. Right. And so this this sort of narrative that takes all those people and renders them invisible, I think, just is not doing us any service. And so I'm hopeful that that sort of continuing to make space for those narratives is is a way through this moment. Um, but I'm happy to take questions from folks if you have them, um, or for us to just kind of engage in a conversation together. Thank you, Nima. And I think our group is um, a good size for if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask your question directly, feel free. I'll go first. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Nima, very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, in the second reading that that you uh, you gave to us, you talked a lot about uh, your parents. Um, so I'm interested in their uh, like immigration story. Mm -hmm. So like, why do they end up in West Virginia? And then uh, what do they think about uh, the kind of work that you're doing? What do they think about the book? Um, just what kind of conversations have you had with them about you know your identity and, and how does it relate to theirs? Like, has there been anything that has come of that? Yeah. Um, so my parents immigrated right after 1965 the heart seller act kind of opened up immigration from asia but with conditions right anyone who was coming had to have a professional 
um, degree in order to come and you had to be coming to fill uh, jobs where there were gaps in the American economy. Um, and so my dad came to New York first and he did his residency there. But when it came to that time to look for work, there were conditions. You could only, if you were going to sort of like get residency here, you either had to go work in rural places or in um, densely populated urban places. Those were op options because those were the two places where there were shortages. Um, so he had studied occupational medicine and Union Carbide Corporation had their headquarters in Manhattan and they were interviewing for physicians at one of two plants. One was in Institute West Virginia and one was in Sea Drift, Texas. And uh, West Virginia was closer to New York than Texas was. And that was about all the calculation that went into going there. You know, when my parents came uh, to, to West Virginia in the, in the Kanawha Valley, there were only three Indian families there before them. Um, but as often happens with immigrant communities, once you get a little bit of a foothold, it starts to be a place where it's like, oh, this classmate from medical school is looking for a job in this field. And I know this hospital needs somebody. And we start to sort of like build. And so my parents were really part of that initial group of folks who started to really kind of create or make visible a pathway um, for coming and settling and, and, um, and making West Virginia home. And I, you know, like, I don't feel like I meet an Indian family from from the part of West Virginia that I'm from, who doesn't say like the first place we had dinner was at your parents' house. Um, they were the first table we ate at when we when we came. Um, but it's also I think important to know that for for my parents, West Virginia is home. They actually spent more of their adult lives there than they did in India. Um, and I think they possess like a really profound sense of gratitude for like what that place and the employment that my dad had um, made possible. I think that. Um, it is very hard to understand institutional racism when you are an immigrant to this country. Um, I think it takes being here for a generation. I think that that is a real point of difference between me and my parents, which is like, you know, they didn't, I think school is where we learn racism. Like school is where we learn institutional racism in a lot of ways. It's where it, it becomes visible um, because you are in this institution and you're watching how it comes down on people differently. But my parents didn't have that experience. Like they came as fully formed adults and they were in professional context. And so they didn't experience the same West Virginia that I did. Um, they were buffered in a lot of ways. Um, by class, they were buffered by profession. Um, I think that when things happen, because I think that things did happen, but when things happen, they were able to write those things off as interpersonal and as like, well, this is just this person. Um, and they didn't have a bigger frame to put it in. Um, whereas I think having been born and raised here and having seen how this country behaves and historically has behaved towards people of color, like, I think I have a different analysis than they do. And so I think sometimes like that has been a, a point of difference. I will say, I feel like even for them, they've now lived here for 50 years. I think their understanding has evolved a lot. I think the 2016 election was a real wake up call for them. I think 9-11 was the first one. Um, and then I think 2016 was the second one in which they sort of realized that maybe their analysis about where we were um, was not quite sound um and that there are there were um deep deep threads of history in this country that they needed to do more work to understand um so that's been i think it's an evolving conversation you know um but i think there there are just uh there's an essay in this book called chemical bonds where i talk about my dad's work at union carbide and then my work as a teacher in the boston public schools and kind of how we understand our relationship to labor and how when you're uh, an immigrant yourself you can't ask questions in the same way. There is no safety net. If you screw up, that's it for everybody. And that's not just it for everybody here. It's also it for everybody at home who you're also financially supporting through being here, right? So you you can't ask certain questions and you can't challenge, challenge certain things because you're aware that you are the safety net. Um, when you're the child of immigrants, like you have a safety net. So you can ask a different kind of question and you can push in different ways because because your parent didn't in a way like anything I'm able to do is is a privilege and it's a privilege I'm afforded by the fact that my parents didn't ask those questions and didn't take that safety net away from me um so I think there is just a lot of I think generational um difference at, that 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 leads us to sort of have different understandings but I think we kind of continue to be in the conversation of trying to come to a shared understanding of you know who are we in this place? How did we get here? What parts of these narratives are true and what parts do we have to unlearn? My parents definitely, you know, 
the model minority myth, myth is a strong, strong myth. It, ha it, it is not just something that is put on people. It is something they also can internalize. And it takes a lot to unlearn that. And I think that is a process that is ongoing for my folks. Well, I see I'm the only one unmuted, so I'll I'll jump in. Um, Nima, thank you so much for sharing your writing with us. It's really um, just very powerful. And um, even it's rare to be moved on Zoom, I find. <laughs> um, so you accomplished the nearly impossible. <laughs> hey, that's amazing. <laughs> well done. So I'd love to hear more about the impact of your book in Appalachia. Um, it strikes me as um, just really potentially transformative for young people, especially who are being invited to um, embrace another narrative of this place and to claim this region um, differently than maybe the dominant narrative suggests they should. So um, can you tell us a little bit about either partnerships you have developed with Apple Shop or other organizations or yeah. how the book is being used, uh, deployed in Appalachia. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to know is that West Virginia is also home to a very um, vile legislature, not that unlike Mississippi State House. Um, I know y'all have, it's not, it's no different. It's the same. Um, but that is sort of a complicating factor in the sense of um, this past session, you know, lots of efforts to ban books, lots of efforts to criminalize librarians and teachers for sharing books with um, young people that are reflective of their identities. And so um, a lot has been like underground kind of trying to, um, so actually during like each session, I've done a thing where I'm like, if you know a young queer person, like we're going to get them a book. And so we're like, you know, trying to sort of like, or like, I know this teacher, I can send this teacher 10 books and they're going to get them out on the sly or things like that. Um, but one really powerful entity in West Virginia that I've um, built a really strong relationship with is the ACLU of West Virginia. And they actually run um, a really beautiful camp called an Appalachian Queer Youth Summit every summer for a week um, and it's for queer kids from all over Appalachia. Um, and I went down last summer and it was, you know, if you're a queer kid in West Virginia, you might be the only queer kid in your school, right? Or in your town or at your church. Like you really, it's like that feeling of being the only one. It's, I get it, but this is like, you're the only one and the government wants you to not exist is a whole other level of difficult, right? So this camp is kids from all over West Virginia coming together to be with each other for a week and to learn both to like build relationships with one another and recognize that you're not by yourself, but also to think about what does it look like to organize? What does it look like to build relationships with communities so that we can fight for a place that is more welcoming of us? Again, this idea, like I think when I was growing up, I thought you had to pick. I thought I can't be Appalachian and queer and Indian. Like I have to choose. I'm not allowed to be all those things. And I think what the ACLU is really trying to help people see is you don't have to pick. Like you can fight to make a place the place you want it to be. That's been such a powerful piece of work to be a part of and to see. And I just, I'm always struck, you know, there was a young person there last summer who said, you know, I spend most of my time feeling like I'm at the bottom of a swimming pool. And this camp, like I came here and for the first time, I understand what it means to come up for air and like look around and see that there are other people up here. And so like, even though I'm going to have to go back to the bottom of the swimming pool when I leave here, like I know there's a top now. Um, and that knowledge is really powerful, right? Like that knowledge that like, even if you feel really alone, you're not alone, I think can be a thing that helps people to sustain themselves in very difficult moments. And that for me is, I think what the book has also done. Um, I get messages from queer kids in Appalachia and I just like, like literally every time I just cry, right? Because what they're saying again and again is like, I am so lonely and I feel less lonely when I read your book. And that, um, you know, like, I kind of feel like who cares about the New York Times bestseller list? Like if I made a queer Appalachian kid feel less lonely, like that's all I, that's all I want. Like that's, that's all any of us can really want is to, that like the words we write help people to feel like they can continue, period. They can continue because they're not alone. Um, so that I think has been just I think, again, confirming of the idea that like, yeah, it's a little story. It's a little book. It's a little story in some ways, but like actually those little stories are really important. We don't have enough of them. Um, too many people don't see themselves on the shelf. Um, and too many people, the versions that they see on the shelf don't make it feel like they can belong. 
And so the way that a story can extend belonging, I think there's just been a real lesson in that, that like, you know, yes, my book is about being queer Indian and Appalachian, but like people in each of those identities who don't share the other ones have told me like, I saw myself in here and I'm like, okay, like that's, that is, that's the work. Um, I think that's the most important thing we can do. So that's been, yeah, really, really rewarding. And there have been like cool things that have happened sort of more in like the literature world. Like, uh, the book was a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award, which is really great. Um, I'm very appreciative of that, but like, it's, I think it's, for me, it's like not where the value comes, right? The value comes in those, in those queer kids and those little bookstores and little libraries who have a book on the shelf that they feel like sees them. I'll go next. So I want to say two thank yous. One, uh, I want to thank the folks who organized this at Talks, Afton, you and your colleagues for, for doing this. Um, this was the first South Talks I was able to <clears throat> attend because I'm a remote employee. I live in Maryland. And so it was fantastic to be able to be here. Uh, secondly, thank you, Nima. That was, um, I, I'm, I'm also Desi. And yeah. so when you were reading from your book and as you're talking, um, it felt like you were holding my heart in your hands. Oh. And, uh, you know, initially when I heard you say that this that you were not trying to represent other people through your words, there was a knee-jerk part of me that wanted to say, but you also just told my story or parts <laughs> of my story. And then and then I thought, you know, and I don't want to appropriate your story by any mm. means, uh, but I think that there are elements of your story that speak to a struggle that may or may not be universal, not just amongst immigrants, but I think amongst humans in general, there's always this tension of trying to reconcile yourself to uh, where, when, and who you are mm -hmm. and develop a sense of self, self while you're trying to fit within where, when, and with whom you are. And so I, I feel like in that sense, your story is a, is a universal story. And I haven't read your book, but it is next on my <laughs> list, absolutely. And I guess I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say how moved I am. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think um, I think what you're saying is something I've heard from lots of people, right? And I think what it made me realize, um, and I'm actually... I'm a big fan of Miss Marvel. I don't know if you all have watched the oh, Miss yeah. Marvel. Okay, right. So Iman Vellani was on a podcast, and um, Miss. What I loved about Miss Marvel was how specific it was. Like, um, all the moves were right. Like they got all the pieces down to the music. And and what it taught me or showed me is like what happens when people from a community are involved at all levels of production. So like they're picking the music, they're in the writers' room, they're the producer, they're the director, they're the actor. Like that's when you get it right. Right. That's when like people see themselves and are like, yeah, you this wasn't just like Bridgerton where we threw some brown people on the screen, but then none of the cultural specifics are right. This is like people got it. And she was on a podcast and she said this idea that has really struck with me, which is she said, you know, I think people talk about representation, but it's not it's not representation of just like a generic brown person. That is the thing people are looking for. People are looking for specificity. Like specificity is representation. And I think what I realized when I was writing this is that I wrote a very specific story, but that specificity is what actually allows people to see themselves represented. It's those details. It's like that grain size. That's like, oh, you're right here with me. Like, even if this isn't your story, you're beside me in this story. And that's where you feel that kind of connection and resonance is in the specificity of the details. Um, so I think you're right. Like, I think it's a thing I'm learning too is uh, I think I'm sensitive to not wanting people in Appalachia to feel like I'm telling their story, right? I think they've already had that happen, I think. And people don't feel good about that book. Um, and so I'm sensitive to that, but I, I hear what you're saying, which is like in telling a very specific story, you can also create a lot of space for people to feel like their stories are mirrored there. That makes sense. Yeah, I could smell the talcum powder as you yeah. spoke about it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
hesitate to ask this question because my memory is failing me and I listened to the book, but I believe it is in Chemical Bonds in that essay where you describe an idea. Is it cultural responsibility? It's you talking about um, a, a kind of a difference in how you see things from your dad. Yeah, the ethics, kind of this question of ethics. Yes. Yeah, it's the question of like this idea of ethics of place, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I think that this this group might be interested in hearing about that. This yeah, of- it is. It, so my dad was a physician at Union Carbide, um, and you know, in his role as a plant doctor, like he he inhabited some interesting and complicated space. He was a plant doctor because you wanted to like address issues at the plant before they went anywhere else besides the plant, right? Like you don't want, you want to deal with things in house um, because you don't want to sort of contribute to narratives about the plant being dangerous or other things like that. At the same time, he also like went around in our community and gave flu shots to everybody at like during flu season. Like the tire guy got a flu shot, the guy who ran the deli got a flu shot, everyone on the street got a flu shot, right? When they went to India, they would buy medicine in bulk and bring it back because it was so much cheaper there. He didn't have to have prescriptions for it and people couldn't afford blood pressure medicine. So like he would do things like that. When I talk about things like that with people who are not from West Virginia, they're like, that's very unethical. It's like wildly unethical. How could he do those things? But in Appalachia, um, it's not because the way that people, and again, I think this is a similarity. Like um, one of my favorite Appalachian writers is a woman named Anne Pancake. And she talks about this idea of the kinship economy, right? And the kinship economy is this idea that when you're from a small place, you understand nobody is coming to save you. There is no superhero. If we're going to survive, it's because we recognize need. And if we are able to meet that need, we meet it, knowing that when we have need, somebody else in our community is going to meet it, right? So when my neighbor was having a heart attack, there's no ambulance to call where we lived. They called my dad, right? And in the same way, like when my parents needed help, like my neighbor was who was coming, right? So ethics means something different than I think this like capital E ethics of like the wide world. I think that way of thinking doesn't accommodate for the way in which folks in marginalized communities need one another to survive and and like are going to cross those capital e ethical lines if they have to because those lines aren't protecting them um and i think that that has been a real learning for me or and also a real um I like to say there's this like Venn diagram of queerness, Appalachianness, and immigrantness that I don't think anyone else thinks about very much, but I think about a lot, which is all three of those groups are profoundly marginalized communities, right? And in all three of those groups, chosen family is, that is what you're relying on. Those are the people who are going to keep you safe. Those are going to be the people who keep you alive is your chosen family. And ethics in the context of chosen family, it's a different thing. You go back to the HIV epidemic and you see people stealing medicine from one place to give it to another because like couldn't get it otherwise, couldn't afford it, couldn't get it. So what are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to move it if we have to. Um, That writing about my dad is what sort of helped me to kind of in a way, like unlearn some of those capital E ethics ideas or question them or think about like, who do those ideas serve and who's not served by them? Um, and and how do we sort of understand people's choices in the context of the place that they live and how that place is shaping kind of how they move? Thank you. We have time for one more. One. Okay, I'll ask the last one. <laughs> I have one that's not super serious, if that's so cool. <laughs> okay. right. Yeah. Um, so I, I just need to know if you have listened to the Brandy Carlisle version of Country Roads. Uh, it's one of my daughter's um, bedtime. Yeah, songs. I figured it was going to be high in that rotation. I, yeah. like, I really appreciated like a queer artist actually like sort of reinterpreting one of these very like absolutely identified with West Virginia with yeah. Appalachia and uh you know delivered originally in like a non Beverly Hillbillies way yes. but not really appreciated for what a song it is and then like you get all these other little facets of it out of um you know somebody with a authentic interpretation but that is again 
another's you know mm-hmm. country road story anyway that was my only one no absolutely yeah so my 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 child gets sung that song uh john prines i remember everything and then like a, a very traditional gujarati hymn she's a mess she's gonna be a very complicated kid but that's her that's her bedtime uh song list is that it's also just a much more low-key version of that song The i tried the john denver one and i was like this is not a bedtime song <laughs> John Denver is busy (laughs) as a musician. Exactly. Well, thank you very much, Nima, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, This has been wonderful. Thank you. And we'll have to have you back so you can come. Yes, and go to Snack Bar. Yes. Because I don't know if y'all, I mean, you probably have, but he wrote a book. His book came out at the same time my book did. Uh, and I just was always so I'm like, I've never met you, but I think we should talk because we have some similar, yeah. similar experiences. It's super good. The recipes are super good. Um, yeah. yeah. And he's a fantastic human. Yeah, too. no, I mean, I think and and again, is this idea of like, he's from Mississippi, like he's not didn't just land there like this is the place that he's from. Um, I'm just super I'm always interested to meet people who kind of share that tiny yeah. slice of existence. So Hopefully well, and it's like, I feel like that book, one of the things it does is it shows you how the slice is not as tiny as we might think, you know, between the collard greens and the okra and the oh, rice yeah. and things that are, you know, um, maybe not if, if somebody thinks about, again, the stereotypical way that your deep South or Appalachian household, like make certain things versus uh, like the kind of um, numbers of spices and blends and flavors that come in um, through Vish's uh versions of everything anyway I always have thought that that's super interesting about um all of our foods and that that sharing of culture that we can do if we'll do it (laughs) yeah I actually have a there's an essay in the book that's called the Hindu Hillbilly Spice Company that's a catalog of spices but it looks at all those intersections between Appalachian and Indian food so there's some shared space there for sure yeah well thank you all and thank you Nima Enjoy thank the- you. Thank you all yeah. so much for coming. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Nima. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye.